The first question my graduate advisor ever asked me was, how crazy are you? Now, this was in an interview when I was trying to get a position in her lab, and so I was expecting questions about the fundamentals of biology or my research experience, questions that I could answer with ease. But this, this took me completely aback. And so I stopped and thought for a second and decided that a crazy question warranted a similar answer. And so I respond, pretty crazy. And thankfully, that turned out to be the right response. She smiles and then goes on to tell me about this high-risk, high-reward project that she'd been dying to get somebody to take on. High-risk, because there was a good chance it wouldn't pan out, and high-reward, because if it did, it could fundamentally change our understanding of biology. And so the gist was this. All of the complexity of life can be boiled down into four letters. A, C, G, and T. DNA's four bases that come together in all sorts of combinations to give us a blueprint for life. And within DNA, our cells have all of the instructions needed to build complex molecular architectures called proteins that make us who we are. Now, in the 1960s, a group of scientists sussed out how exactly our cells make sense of DNA's information, working out that our cells read DNA three letters at a time, and then either add in a protein building block to a growing chain or stop construction altogether. Triplets of four DNA letters give our cells 64 possible instructions on how they should build these protein structures. And you can see them all behind me in what we call the genetic code, a table that you can find in pretty much any biology textbook. And deciphering this code cracked open the doors for modern biology to bust on through. But those scientists never banked on the possibility that there might be more than four letters. Our genetic stuff is subject to all kinds of chemical tweaks and structural rearrangements. We've known about them for decades, but no one ever considered that they might act as a fifth sixth or seventh functional letter, until right before I started my PhD. A group of scientists found that one such structural tweak actually changed the way that our cells were reading DNA's original message. And so this was a hint at the possibility that there might actually be a fifth letter. And that idea blew my mind. A fifth letter would mean that that genetic code that I had taken for granted, that I had committed to memory, that I had taken to be immutable truth, rather than the best, most educated guess that scientists had at the time, that genetic code might be incomplete. A fifth letter would mean that there were more triplets than those scientists had originally thought, and more triplets whose meaning would need to be deciphered. And I, a mere graduate student, could be the one to help out. I was all in. And straight out the gate, I got this super promising result, a hint that our crazy hypothesis might not be so crazy after all. But a year plotted on, and then two, and I just couldn't replicate that initial result. And so I was looking at a dead end with nothing to show for myself. Now, that first brush with failure was not only devastating for me, but it was extremely isolating. I was at this elite academic institution, surrounded by scientists making groundbreaking discoveries and being celebrated for their achievements. And all around me, my classmates were making great discoveries of their own, well on track to become elite scientists themselves. And so I didn't want to tell anybody about my failure. I didn't want to come out as a bona fide imposter. But eventually, I had to. If I was to finish out this PhD thing, I would need to come up with a new idea. I'd need to start from scratch, and that meant admitting that I had failed. And so I started talking. I started talking to my peers about my panic at having to start all over again. I started sharing my fear that I may never have another good idea worth pursuing. And much to my surprise, 
they started telling me about their own failures, their own fears, their own doubts in the lab. And with that knowledge that I wasn't failing alone, I began to regroup and to recover. And so I decided I wanted to share my first brush with failure with the world, with the hope that they might find some peace in it as well. And so I decided to start a blog, a Tumblr called Science Confessionals, where scientists could anonymously confess their fears, their frustrations, their doubts with the world. And initially it was met with great response. It was shared on Twitter, on Facebook. People were coming up to me at university happy hours and thanking me for what I had done. So I was feeling pretty good about myself. But then a week goes on, and another, and another, and I start to notice that the only people contributing to this blog are myself and a few friends. And so my blog about failure, it was failing. But I'd already begun to understand one of the most important lessons in science that within every failure is an opportunity to learn and to grow. And so it wasn't enough for science confessionals to fail. I had to understand why it had floundered. And so I turned to my friends who I knew had shared the blog and asked, have you contributed? And if not, why not? And I got a range of responses, but they really all boiled down to this. I didn't feel my failures were good enough or interesting enough to share. In other words, they wanted their failures, like their science, to be high impact, to be novel, to be innovative, to be noteworthy. And that told me something interesting about the psyche of the scientist. We want everything we do to have meaning, to be for some greater good. But when you're in the middle of failure, it's really hard to see the good in that especially because we just don't have the tools to talk about it, to learn from it, and to recover from it. But we can change that. I never did figure out if there was more to the genetic code than what we see in our textbooks. It remains an open question, and one that I hope more scientists will take on as new technologies emerge and more crazy people like myself wander into the world of biology. And that's exactly why I share this story so that some young scientist out there can use my failure as a starting place to get closer to an answer. And if they fail, at least they'll fail differently than I did. Because failure in science is frequent and it is inevitable. We are asking big, bold questions about the unknown. And so we're bound to fail every once in a while. But what makes science so successful and scientists so special is our relentless optimism, our resilience, our unfailing faith that on the other side of failure, we'll get a little closer to an answer. And that's why I think it's such a shame that we don't talk about failure more. Because imagine how many more people could see themselves in science if they understood that science wasn't just done by lone geniuses who had all of the answers. I mean, if we had all the answers, there'd be no point to doing science at all. Instead, science is done by people who employ this self-correcting method to chip away at the boundaries of our ignorance. And so if we're bound to fail, and fail often, I ask why not fail openly, honestly, and together? But as you all know, I am pretty crazy. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.